Well, hi everyone. Time for another update on the ongoing Washington Bridge saga in Rhode Island. There's been a lot of new developments. There's an article that came out on October 15th, 2024 from WPRI.com. And uh, they conveyed some news developments that are consistent with what I predicted in some of my earlier videos. So let's just go through it. Also, the state of Rhode Island, uh, Rhode Island DOT has issued their request for qualifications their second attempt to get people to submit proposals for design and construction of replacement bridge uh, on the westbound lanes for Washington Bridge. So let's look at a couple of key aspects of this article. The governor announced that they're pushing back the demolition completion of Washington Bridge until the end of 2025. They paused the demolition in mid-September, supposedly to allow more time for discovery, that is the people involved in the various lawsuits that Rhode Island has initiated against various consultants and contractors previously involved with the Washington Bridge. And after about a month's delay, there was also problems with excessive noise at night, dust. R Rhode Island uh, DOT resumed demolition here just a couple of weeks ago. I'm reporting, I'm recording this video on Thursday, October 24th. At this point, the state has given up predicting what the cost and schedule is going to be for this replacement bridge. That's how badly they've bungled this whole thing. And they can't afford to look any worse than they have already, if, if that's possible, by continuing to throw numbers out there that get surpassed uh, seemingly week by week with additional information or more realistic information as to how much this bridge is going to cost and how long it's going to take to actually get it designed and built. Now this demolition contract was fixed price with up to $3 million in early completion bonuses. They're going to have to modify this contract not only to account for the month-long pause in demolition activity, but now they want this demolition contractor to remove the pile caps and remove the piles down to the mud line, so the, the base of the river underneath the bridge, so the, the substructure. This article goes on to say, the state had initially planned to let the company hired to build the new bridge decide whether it wanted to reuse the substructure or tear it down. But Rhode Island DOT director Peter Alviti said they received feedback from potential contractors through their request for information process, or RFI, indicated a majority of them said they would want to start with a clean slate. Well, yeah, no kidding, I mentioned that many months ago. It made no sense to attempt to reuse these foundations and get a surprise that they weren't as good a condition as maybe people had assumed or only being able to assess a few of the piling and hope that they were representative of the other pilings that had been stalled to support the piers for this existing bridge. They just set themselves up for an additional delay. Now, as I mentioned, this request for qualifications came out on October 15th from Rhode Island DOT. So they're looking to replace the westbound Washington Bridge with five 12 foot wide lanes with 10 foot shoulders. And there's two bridges, one over the Seekonk and then one over Gano Street. Now let's take a look at this overall schedule listed in the request for qualifications. So they have till November 19th, 2024 to submit any questions to Rhode Island DOT. And then their proposals are due November 26, 2024. And then early December, Rhode Island DOT will conduct interviews with people who responded. And then they're going to shortlist two firms or two teams by December 11th, 2024. At that point, Rhode Island DOT will issue a draft request for proposal by December 18th, 2024. They'll get feedback on the request for proposal and they'll go through the process with these two firms until ultimately they'll select one of the two teams on June 6th, 2025 with a notice to proceed July 15th, 2025. So that mid 2025 date will be the start of design work because they're not able to start construction now that the demo has extended through the end of 2025. So based on the timelines listed by Rhode Island DOT, new construction won't be possible until early January, 2026. And projects like this would take every bit of two years at the under the best circumstances, probably more like three years. So you're looking at an estimated completion date if this timeline holds true of probably 2028, or 2029, which is not very satisfactory, I'm sure, for the 
people who have to commute across the eastbound bridge in both directions at this point. So in this request for qualifications, again, Rhode Island DOT advises that the design build team is not responsible for messing with existing substructures, can't reuse existing bridge foundations. Rhode Island DOT has initiated a geotechnical investigation, which they call limited, and anticipates providing that report to interested firms on January 2025. I don't know what's taken them so long. They should have been out there in December getting new borings. I mean, it was obvious back then that this bridge was going to have to come down. Certainly they knew it by February if they didn't realize it in December. I don't know why they're losing so much time performing this geotechnical investigation. Now, there was a conceptual set of plans that was issued with this RFQ, and we can glean some interesting things from looking at this document. First of all, the spans are much, much longer. So where this ramp peels off to the north, it will now be Pier 2. And you can look at some of these spans over 220 feet long. Again, much longer than the existing bridge. So it looks like the shortest spans on this new bridge will be at least 160 feet long, with around 220 being typical, 220 feet. Now let's contrast that with the existing bridge. So we had Pier 2 where this northbound ramp peels off the westbound bridge and that location corresponded to existing Pier 4. So obviously the spans are much longer with the replacement bridge. Now let's look at the layout here. They're showing drilled shafts for supporting the abutment and the piers for the new bridge. And uh, I don't think they're only going to have two drilled shafts per pier. That is highly unlikely given how long these spans are and how wide the bridge is. I would expect many, many shafts, probably a group of shafts at a given pier. Even if you use very large diameter shafts, 12 plus foot diameter, I don't see how they're going to be able to get away with just two two drilled shafts per pier. And they'll have to be careful installing these new drill shafts. I've shown previous videos where a drill shaft is an excavation made in the ground, and then the, the void, the opening, is filled with reinforced concrete, and that provides much greater support than certainly an individual pile, and in many cases, more than a, a very large pile group. These drill shafts have tremendously high capacities, particularly if there's what they call a rock socket with a portion of the sidewall and the base being in contact with bedrock. I don't have enough subsurface information at this point to indicate how deep these drill shafts are likely to be or how much of it's gonna be a rock socket. But uh, for bridges I'm familiar with, typical drill shafts that are economical are in the range of say 50 to 100 foot uh, depths. And that's, that's quite common. Now they'll have to be careful though, installing drilled shafts next to the existing eastbound bridge. It's common that a casing is advanced to support the excavation and then they'll lower drill tooling in to excavate the interior of soil and rock. Usually they're advancing casing with a vibratory hammer, but causing excess vibrations to the existing bridge is likely to be problematic. I've seen many projects where concerns about vibration during drill shaft drilling leads to the use of a casing oscillator. So you can see at the base, you got these jaws that clamp around the casing and there's a hydraulic mechanism that pushes and pulls, pushes and pulls. So it twists the casing into the ground and has very little associated vibrations. I see this casing installation required at many railroad bridges. A lot of these existing railroad bridges that are being replaced date back to the late 1800s. And uh, I worked on a bridge project in Iowa where the piers were supported on what they call a raft, which was a bunch of tree branches essentially woven together to form a pallet. And then they used uh, masonry to build the pier wall. And the weight of additional courses of the pier would push that raft into the sand in the, in the river channel. So there was only loose, to medium dense sand underneath this raft, essentially within mid channel of the deposits. Again, with Rhode Island DOTs uh, having all their eggs in one basket, as it were, relative to the I-195 crossing of the Seekonk River, they can't afford to mess up the existing eastbound bridge in the process of trying to replace the westbound bridge. And then curiously, they show presumably smaller diameter drill shafts at the abutment, but certainly many, many more drill shafts than at the pier. So, this concept doesn't make a lot of sense to me in terms of any 
accuracy regarding the size and number of drilled shaft foundations that's going to be required of a bridge with uh, this wide and long of spans. Now let's go through some of the more interesting aspects of the request for qualifications document. So Rhode Island DOT is characterizing this two-phase process to be best value design build. So they're looking for federal funding to pay for the bulk of this work. So they describe their two-phase process. Rhode Island DOT will select the design build proposer that provides the best value to the state. Only the most highly qualified respondents from this phase one will be invited to submit competitive proposals in response to the phase two request for proposals. The purpose of this phase one solicitation of statements of qualifications is to seek qualified proposals based upon recent relevant work experience, past performance, understanding of the scope of work, and qualifications of the design build contractor and its subcontractors and design consultants with a focus on an integrated project approach. Phase two involves the solicitation of separately sealed technical proposals and cost proposals from the shortlisted respondents that were selected in phase two. In the phase two review process, Rhode Island DOT will evaluate the technical proposals and proposed designs together with the cost proposals to determine the best value design bill proposal. So they're not gonna pick the cheapest one here. So I'll go through the weighting in terms of how they're gonna score these proposals, but there's going to be a lot of room for subjective judgments here. It, there could be some surprises in terms of who's selected. But again, I don't know how many interested firms they're going to get since Rhode Island, the state of Rhode Island is involved with suing so many entities, designers and contractors who have previously been involved with the Washington Bridge. I've stated in previous videos that they've likely poisoned the well. So I suspect what's going to happen, there'll be somebody that submits this, this go around, but there'll probably be some international uh, major design build contractor, and uh, they'll probably build in the cost of future litigation into their proposals just to cover themselves. And uh, Rhode Island of DOT will eventually get a replacement bridge, but it's going to be very expensive and very time consuming based on what I've seen so far. So let's look at some of the major scope items. You have surveying, geotechnical investigation, subsurface utility engineering, which you have to figure out what's there and you have to move it in some cases or many cases, very slow, time-consuming process. Bridge, culvert, and wall analysis and design, highway design and construction, traffic control, traffic engineering, quality assurance, quality control, environmental permitting. You have your final design. Then you have the Gano Street off-ramp bridge, stormwater management, maintenance of access to local businesses throughout construction, landscaping, and so on. And this last entry here, there's aspects of Endangered Species Act. Okay, so the responding teams will have to have design professionals and construction professionals. And what this document says as part of the RFQ is that by the time of submission of the proposal, the designers have to be licensed as individuals and through their companies to practice engineering in the state of Rhode Island. Now let's go through the key roles for the design build team that's gonna submit on this request for qualifications. You have a design build project manager, design manager, construction manager, construction superintendents, bridge lead, civil highway lead, geotechnical lead, traffic, drainage, stormwater, environmental, quality control, so on. Safety, scheduler, environmental monitors, bridge engineer slash architect. They'll address the aesthetic aspects of the new bridge. Just more things they're looking for in the request for qualifications. I'll put a link to this RFQ in the description to this video in case you want to read this whole thing for yourself. Now let's get into the evaluation part. A technical review group the majority of which must be currently employed by the state of Rhode Island, will be convened by the state. The group will be comprised of a chairperson and Rhode Island DOT technical personnel assigned to evaluate and score all statements of qualifications. All members of the group will be required to execute a conflicts disclosure statement prior to the Division of Purchases release of the SOQs. Rhode Island DOT reserves the right to utilize any appropriate technical resources to provide assistance in evaluating the SOQ. Technical resources will act in an advisory capacity only and will not score any documentation. I certainly hope they reach out to outside consultants and contractors to assess these statements of qualifications because I don't think, given the past performance of Rhode Island DOT, they have the sufficient technical capability 
to do this solely on their own. So let's go through the scoring. Relevant work experience, zero to 30 points. Understanding of the scope of work, zero to 30 points. Experience and availability of key personnel, zero to 25 points. Then they're gonna assess the capabilities of the firms in terms of the various aspects that are needed for this project. That's zero to five points. And then general evaluation, which is pretty much a fudge factor, is zero to 10 points. So it's a hundred point max. So as I mentioned, this process, it makes sense in general, but again, they're, they're dragging it out. There's a lot of room for subjective evaluation. And again, I, I think the shortlisted firm or the one that ultimately gets awarded this project is more than likely not going to be the cheapest uh, by any measure. So how internally do Rhode Island DOT weight schedule or qualifications and other experiences? You see the numerical breakdown, but when you dig into the details, there's a, a lot and perhaps too much room for judgment. Now these companies that are responding to the statement of qualifications, they have to fill all these forms, basically saying there's no corruption, no influence peddling, involved in this process. That's pretty standard documentation. So let me know what you think. That's an overview of how this is gonna go. So again, I'm thinking that at the earliest, this westbound bridge is gonna be completed by late 2028, probably early to mid 2029, uh, if they're lucky, if they get reasonable proposals and, and people who are actually interested in working for Rhode Island DOT given that, again, so many people who have been involved in the past with Washington Bridge are now being sued by the state of Rhode Island. So with that, I wanna send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support as well as those of you who've provided super thanks. I'm gonna roll credits at the end. I've got a lot of new updates and new subject matter videos that are coming out, so please stay tuned for future videos.